Belgium. So, uh, like I said, I've been six times on training camps here, and I feel very familiar with the terrains and uh, the mapping style. So, I think it will be a very exciting race, and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yannick, what makes you being one of the best sprint orienteers in the world? I think nowadays when uh, the walk sprint is split, it, or the walk actually is split into forest and sprint, now more boys or more guys, more runners have uh, like focused more on sprint. But I've done that already 10 years. So uh, I think those 10 years, that's the most important. I've been preparing for sprint so long time. So yeah, I think that makes me a strong sprint orienteer. And finally, you have been in fourth position, the last two world championships in sprint. How much are you eager to win this medal? Uh, I think, I think, I'm not eager to win, of course, I would like to win, but I think taking a medal, that would be already a very big step forward, so, and I believe I can do that, so, uh, let's do it. Let's do it, say Anik Mikkels here, and it's what Peter Sporting about, it's about that he's been number four two times in the second season, so he's been mega, mega sulky for to get a win medal. And he's one of the runners who has specialized in to be a very, very good to the sprint. You can also see him in the sky one time. But what do you think it gives him for the advantage to have won so much? He's been sprint to the sprint focus in 10 years. What gives him the advantage in the day? Yes, but he's been out in a very many different situations, and he's been out in a very many different problematikker, så noget sprinterøjning, det er faktisk meget komplekst at prøve at finde det bedste, korteste vejvalg. Så jeg tænker bare, at han har opbygget så meget erfaring, der gør, at han kan tage nogle beslutninger på ryggraden nærmest. Inden vi begynder at tale om kvinderne, så skal vi lige tale om en mand mere, som også er en af favoritterne. Du nævnte ham ikke, men vi var ude at tale med Kasper Fosser fra Norge, som er regerende verdensmester i Polangestein til Sjov til sidste år i Tjekkiet. Og vi spurgte ham om, at han vandt en World Cup for en måned siden i Sverige på sprint, den første af den slags, han har vundet, og vi spurgte ham, hvad det betød for ham at vinde den World Cup i forhold til i dag. Det betyder meget. I Borås, jeg tror ikke, at det var muligt. Så jeg blev virkelig overrasket mig selv der, og jeg tror, at jeg er virkelig godt forberedt for at vinde den sprint at World Cup denne gang. Um, yeah, with uh, yeah, I, I have no reason to think that I'm uh, not going to uh, be competing against the very, very top places. But you said you didn't believe that it's possible to win the sprint in the World Cup. Why do you say that like that? I was a little bit about uh, my uh, entrance to the races in uh, uh, I had uh, uh, yeah, my my training hadn't hadn't gone uh, <laughs> gone to plan. Uh, uh, Previous months, and uh, uh, I yeah, well, was quite unsure about the shape. I think uh, I think if the World Cup had been one week earlier, I wouldn't have made it in uh, in the shape uh, that was needed for the World Cup So uh, it was that close. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, it was really nice to see that the body body really uh, responded well that day and, uh, and uh, got uh, got. Uh, to the next level, basically, uh, just that week. And now, uh, what do you and Andromeda Team expect from the individual sprint in Weile, the final competition here in Denmark? Yeah, it's going to be a uh, bit tricky, for sure. Uh, probably lots of artificial fences and, uh, and uh, narrow streets uh, passages. Uh, we've been using, uh, or we, we, we've been preparing for this race for several years now, actually. And, uh, I feel like we know <laughs> they like really well from from street view and, uh, and uh, have, we, we also made our own maps and tried to make, uh, to make some forces like this. And, uh, I think we're all really well prepared for this race. And you are also prepared now for the final competition in Denmark? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, this is my one chance this year to be an uh, individual world champion. Uh, so I'm really, really excited. Det var Kasper Fosser, altså Norges største bud på en, en medalje i dag. Han har været skadet, som han også var lidt inde på her, og stod derfor også over i tirsdags, sparede benene og har så friske ben, som han nu har. Hvor gode er hans chancer? Jeg tænker, det er rigtig gode. Øhm, ja, jeg tænker, at han øh, sagtens kunne være den, der regner med løbens tid. Nu er det cirka 10 minutter til, vi skal sætte de første løber i stedet. Vi tager lige en hurtig snak om kvinderne også. Der er jo én favorit, der sådan trænger.
Hello and welcome back to the 2022 World Orienteering Championships. We are live this evening from Vila in Denmark and it's going to be a fantastic afternoon, evening of sprint orienteering. It is, of course, the last competition, the last race of these World Championships and we will crown two more World Champions over the next couple of hours. It's going to be fast, it's going to be furious. They have already raced this morning from about half past nine local time and it was the top 15 in each heat who have made it through to the final today. So what's slightly one more, there was a joint 15th place in the men's. So there are 46 men who are going to be racing uh, around and the order today, the start order is determined by those qualifications, the qualification standings in the heat. So those ones who qualified last will be off last. It's going to be an uh, incredible set of racing around the city here. Again, lots of barriers in place, uh, lots of little passages to go through, lots of route choice as well. And the organizers, the course setters have done everything they can to make this a very technical and exciting sprint race. We've got a glorious arena here in fairly central in the city and um, loads and loads of spectators have turned up to cheer on their favorites we've got flags everywhere we've got a lot of people who've enjoyed the spectator races and they really want to cheer on their uh, their runners and they want to see a fantastic sprint final today and really the the course setters the course planners have wanted to try and surprise the athletes the whole of this week's competition and they've of course carried that forward into today's race into this sprint final what have they done particularly to try and make it something unexpected well first of all they didn't place the start in the arena which uh, i think the runners will expect mm -hmm. because usually you want to give the spectators something extra and they'll let the athletes start in the arena but that's not the case today so they will be starting outside the arena um, then they have quite early into the race they have a map flip the men so they have already the second control they will turn the map and continue reading at the, the back side of the map so uh, but this one is less to surprise the runners but more to keep them uh, Focus because it's it's quite a messy part, let's say, and there's a risk the runners would read to the wrong control otherwise. So I think it's quite a fair, uh, each, uh, fair thing to do at that point. But otherwise, they also try to open some backyards, uh, which are very private when you run through them so you really feel that you're running through someone's garden yep. uh, at one place and uh, that's something I, I think the runners they don't expect so they're, you can't they're, plan for which no, gates exactly. will be open and which gates will be closed if you're doing all the geeking and stuff on, on exactly so suddenly we have some new route choices which you couldn't prepare with the old map and I think that makes it very interesting yeah it's going to be very exciting was there let's look back a little bit at the qualification before we see uh, the map itself um, were there any surprises it was pretty straightforward to be honest it was pretty straightforward um, we don't have the world champion from last year though in the final uh, Isaac von he struggled a lot with injuries during the last month and uh, yeah he didn't make it he came 16 in his heat just missed out by I think two seconds yeah. so uh, very close but I don't think it was so unexpected for him he had a lot of troubles during the last weeks and months so um, but otherwise all the favorites are through some of them uh, had a bit more problems than others we see a quite good group of favorites already quite early into the race uh, for example Daniel Hoopman, uh, Mika Kirmula, Emil Svensk uh, also Matthias Kibbutz quite early or at least midfield so yeah. it's yeah, it's going to be interesting from the beginning and now we see the map and we see the start outside the arena and uh, we start with a short control and then the second control it's a very important one there's a root choice and this is the area in the middle there the yellow area where it's very crucial to run there i think this is impo an important route choice and you see at control two you have the map map flip and it's because uh, of the reason that you don't read to number five on the way to control two already many Inten it's a lot of intense orienteering in the beginning and then you have a long leg to control nine another route choice another chance to run in this backyard there and uh, then you have a map change at the arena passage and so you can't use this long leg to control nine to read ahead and then it will start directly with a quite a yeah tricky route choice to 11 uh, and 
13 and then especially in this part here, control 14, many options. Then 15, 16, 17 and 18 might be a surprise, but there's no root choice at all there. But then 18, 19 again, I think there are like eight different options <laughs> you can run. It's a very good option to go straight out to the left and all around then. Uh, 19, 20 and 21, some other left or right route choices and then we're back in the finish. Yeah, so that's the course. It's got, a, it's got a good mixture, I think, of lots of different types of sprint orienting and you've got to be good at all of them to, be, to basically be able to win, for me. Yeah, it's very intense, especially in the beginning. I mean, you have this short control to the first one um, and it's no route choice, but still you have, to, you, you have to be focused because it's not, you don't see the control directly from, uh, yeah, you have to read your way to the control and then you have this route choice here and I think that the green route will be the best. It's, in my opinion, I think it's very important that you run either the yellow or the green one and you cross this backyard there. Um, because it's quite a bit shorter. I mean, 50 meters, it's quite a difference. Yeah, but you, and, but you have seconds to see that. You know, if you think about how close that first control is, you'll probably see people stopping there and then they've got to make that decision. That's going to be incredibly tough. But I think if you make the right decision at that control number two, it's also going to benefit you to the control number nine. Because it's, it's a good route choice, the red one here, and you have been there before, so then you can push a little bit more, you can kind of just run you don't have to read your to see where the passages are and then once you're out almost halfway there when you get out of the to the road there i mean then it's from there it's an easy control and it's mostly running so there you have a very clear uh, change in rhythm in in like your orienteering because the the first eight controls were intense and then you get a lot of time to run there and you get a lot of time to kind of relax a little bit in your head and then but of course, uh, as I mentioned before, you have no time to plan ahead because you don't have the map yet. No, exactly. You've got this map change. And this is uh, Idabo back then running out of control number 13. Again, another route choice on this one. And there's one, I think, not even shown on that map that you could do. Uh, it just gives you a little bit of an idea about what the streets look. They will be much busier than this, though, I'm sure. Mm. You can see the route here, 13 to 14. You can run back. It's quite a steep uh, stair there where you have to go if you go the yellow route. Uh, so I think the green one is quite a good option here. Um, but distance-wise, it doesn't really matter. But of course, the, the red one is quite a bit shorter and it's an easy control always when you can. Uh, head out of a passage, just cross the road and head into another passage that makes it very much easy because if you run along a, uh, a road and you have to find the passage to the right, it's much more difficult or to the left, of course. Uh, but if you just cross the road, it's easy to see the passages. Yeah, so that makes it more than half of that leg, the, the red leg is just going straight on yeah. the whole way. It's so it's much easier to execute from that perspective. But it's, I think it's hard to see because you've got to back out Although for me, the runners are starting to see that you've really got to check routes where you back out of the control because they may well be really, really good. Uh, okay, as we said, the start list then is determined by the result from the qualification this morning. So Tommy Hayes, Francesco Mariani, Yannis Bonek, Eric Dola, they were all in uh, 15th place. And then we work up, as you said, that group of Daniel Hubman, three-time sprint champion. Uh, will be very, very strong. Mika Kimmler as well, a really strong uh, Finn who may be underperformed there. Emil Svensk as well. Uh, Aston Key, I think we want to watch out for him. He was looking on fire. He was in, I think, what I called the heat of death in the, um, uh, in the knockout sprint. He could maybe have had the chance a little bit better. Then we've got the group of Ralph Street, Matthias Kibbert, you know, those two, we really, really want to watch out for them. And then we start heading towards those who qualified fastest. You know, we have never really known how, if people hold back a little bit, take a few extra seconds, you know, on the qualifier, if they're confident of getting there. But for me, really, from Casper Fosser onwards, we've got Fosser, who of course didn't run in the knockout sprint, Tim Robertson, who has been missing that win he's got a silver and a bronze he really wants to take that and a few others who are in search of their first ever world champ sprint but also like to highlight Jakob Etzen he has been uh, running very strongly the whole week and uh, he yeah I mean he was very good in the qualification this morning so definitely uh, he's in great shape just uh, peaked for this world championships and uh, 
he will be eager to show what he can do today. All right, here's our first starter, and it's a bit of a special start, and you will see why in just a moment. Because they head out of here, out of that door, cross the road, and the start triangle is not very far away, and you've got lots of decisions to make. And it's a very good start because you can't see anything from the surroundings, you can't see anything from the course, there's no risk that you can see the runner ahead of you heading out uh, it, like to see in which direction they will go. So you will pop out from the trees. The control is just to the left, of, on the very, very left of the picture. There you go. You can see him running through there. It's a very, very short one to number one. And what we mm. want to see is how prepared he is now from control one to control two. Mm. Ah, looks pretty good. And does yeah. he take the, the route choice we think is the quicker one? We'll see. Now he's heading out to the street there, and then he would just pass run over the street and head into the new passage, so we didn't really see which route he chose there. OK, number two, Francesco Mariani. Really strong uh, junior athlete. We should mention there's, there's uh, so many different nations have qualified for these finals, Partic particularly strong. We should have mentioned it when we saw Tommy Hayes, New Zealand, getting loads of runners. I think five runners into uh, the final is really, really impressive for them. Uh, both good uh, distribution in the men's and the women's as well. Really uh, impressive. Mm -hmm. See there. Don't really see yet where he went. Tommy Hayes. Kind of lost the GPS there. Maybe we can follow. Uh, let's see now. Yeah, he's heading into this backyard. So good route there. And he looked pretty strong through, flowing through the control as well. There's also, of course, there's a, an option you can start on the red route and then loop back to join the, to join the other route as well. Okay. Janis Bronek from Austria next up to start. You can see they're looking at the start clock really, really strongly. It's a very tight corner out there towards the first control, towards the start point even, of course, and they're yet to even make the start point. And I think they, you know, they've been kept in the quarantine in the building, being turn, turned around just on their routes out to the start. They're not really going to know exactly where they emerge. And now we can see the first difference uh, in these route choices. Mariani going uh, that longer red route. Uh, it is, it's not always the case, but this, this time it is. Green is the best, maybe yellow the next best, and then it red. It seems to me that Hayes hesitated for a long time there because I mean the tail is 60 seconds this is not a replay or anything so they're live and he definitely lost time there in the beginning and I think he, he didn't see any good route choice he could take he came out of the control very strongly and then stopped maybe Eric Döhler then from Germany is next off just managed to make the mark in qualifying mm -hmm. it's his first walk final Sprints. And now you can see Mary B. Mariani just catching up Tommy Hayes there, I think. Because this is live, this GPS tracking. And you can see Bonek and Mariani are very similar of course we've not got the next part of the map on the on the screen here there we go you can see it now uh, there's a little route choice again it very, fairly easy from two to three but there is a route choice uh, for three to four you've got to come back out the way you came in but then you can go left or right I think to t for you to turn left is much better Robert Mel also of Austria very experienced orienteer been in uh, positions like this time many times before, but though probably more often in the forest. So we can follow him all the way through. Could just see him kind of slow down as he came out from the trees there. Got to be really careful and he goes in too early. He's not read his control descriptions. Mm, that's a mistake. That is a mistake. It's just the other side. And I have to say, I it's did have to... Of, it's a bit of a cheap one because you have to expect it to be on the other side. You, you would really, I think. Uh, 
I have to say, it was hard to see when we were pre-running that one. I, I personally had to check my control descriptions. Yeah, but, uh, but you but did. So yeah, exactly, I did. <laughs> Andy Stittemer's from Latvia then. And now we can be behind uh, the first starter then today, Tommy Hayes. We know he's lost a bit of time already. We think there was maybe a bit of time and now they dip in and out of these. Uh, it's, a, it's a train line that goes overhead and you've got to go this is him in towards control number seven then. It's really, really small passage to follow there. I'll punch control seven and uh, I think we will get the split time at the next control then to see Tommy Hayes set the pace here fairly easy control number eight but this is another route choice then on the way to control number nine but it looks like he has made his mind up at least the first part there there's actually a lot of different ways you can go uh from there but if you were to go back through that uh the garden place the back gardens then you needed to do a sharp uh right back out of that control i think Roda Sleiper then here from Belgium, and the Belgians, really impressive qualification for them. Yeah, they have uh, three runners in the final, so we also have Walter Hus and, uh, of course, Yannick Michels uh, in the very end, or second last starter today. Yes, he is really one of the favourites, and he, he he's one of a uh, few who haven't run the knockout uh, sprint. He's kind of focusing all of his efforts on the individual sprint. It's probably more of a distance that he favours. You can see there, there's almost no one seeing this route, the straight route through the backyard. And this Onek here to split one. So he's now back there at this railway bridge, looking for the control. So he goes the other way than when we saw Tommy Hayes go. He will go uh, left out to the main road and then back into the control. Of course, you've really got to... There's a, quite a lot of different passageways here, and they've actually been quite good to mark some of these uh, undercover passageways that have a gate on them. They've marked them as passageways, but with a, a black line against them to show that you can't go down. But there we go. We can see that it is Mariani in the lead at the moment. And they get the time, of course, from this next control, this eighth control. So the Italian is looking good and the Austrian's really trying to look at these routes. But now. you can really get a feeling how intense it is. It's very hard for Bonnick here to get ahead with, with his map reading. So that's, it's not really proactive map reading here. It's always a little bit behind. And this leads to this, those hesitations. Okay, Bojan Blumenstein then from Germany, next off. Mm -hmm. Had some illness in the beginning of the week. Problems didn't start in the sprint relay. Was back then for the knockout sprint. All right, this is our first runner through the what? arena passage then, Tommy Hayes of New Zealand. And at this point, he can't do any map reading. Instead, he goes through the water. Yeah, he has to go, he through, has the to go through the water. Uh, and he will pick up a new map just around the corner. We can see him about to turn the corner and get a new map then, where uh, it'll be a very, very short control afterwards. You can also see the Italian. Here he is, Francesco Mariani, looking strong. It's quite... I think it's deceptively deep water there. Um, I chose to go through it. Jonas, you decided to, to let me, uh, to watch me go through yeah. it when we tested it earlier. I took the chance to just... Uh, Stay dry. Absorb from the outside. <laughs> Oh, no, I need, I need, it's a warm afternoon, I needed uh, some, a bit of cool down. Okay, Robert Bell, looking very strong, and you've got to spot this little doorway behind the car. You can come out here. But he still has to go to the next control, so he's losing time compared to Mariani. We saw some problems there in the beginning, the broadcasts. Again, everybody going straight through that control. Here's Janis Bonek at the Arena Passage. Eight seconds behind Mariani. Ah, it's, oh. <laughs> it's just a little yeah, bit of entertainment. It's quite kind of good technique there. Yeah. 
Well, it's almost something of a, a steeplechase technique there. Okay, here's the second of the three Belgians in this men's final, Vortehus. He also made it, I think, through to the uh, knockout finals. And then one minute after Vorterhus, we have a three times world champion in his 15th uh, sprint race at the World Championships, Daniel Hoopman. So very soon, yeah. I mean, one of the at least favorites for a top 10 today. And Distigmas nearly misses that little uh, doorway through to the seventh control, but not too many problems. We will follow him through. You can see he's already behind Francesco Marinari, the uh, junior world sprint champion from Turkey last year. Got a lot of people losing a significant amount of time early on. No, here he is then, Daniel Hubman. We said it was his, it's his 15th start and... Uh, the first start this week for Daniel Hoopman. It is the first start this week. He has got one race and one race only. But this is really where his strength is in the, in the individual. You know, he knows he's not got the, the really, really sharp pace uh, anymore to match with. You know, we saw some very young, uh, like, young medalists uh, at, in the knockout sprints. Yeah, it, if you if you want to call the kibbutz a very young runner, oh, that's then... true. I, I, okay, I'm 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 happy for you to correct me there. But you know he's not not got the pace, but he knows how to do this technical orienteering and knows how to 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 push himself individually, make really strong route choices, and make it work here. And an this will be very interesting now if he will see this route through the backyard. I think we've only, we, it's uncertain, but I think we've only seen one person do it so mm -hmm. far. Tommy Hayes, in the beginning, the very first runner, mm -hmm. but he had some hesitation there before he decided it. Yeah, I think it would have been good if he if he was certain with it, he would have been quicker. Okay, Mika Kimmler, also a really strong name, made the semi-final in the knockout sprint, the Finn, and you can see there the, the two sides of the map. You maybe be surprised to only see two controls on the first side of the map, but you, I mean, such is the, the technicality of this, these, of these first two controls, it's, it's hard to, you, you haven't got any time to look any further anyway, but Daniel Hubman, he knows how to get it right when it matters, mm -hmm. and this is a good route choice for and him. And it will think. be interesting to compare his route here to the other ones, to the red one. Uh, but I think this is a very good decision to run here. And then you have been there before, you know that this option exists. So when you go back to control nine, uh, you have already seen that option. You know that you get through and you know how to get through there. Yeah, I think it's a double win. If you spot it, it, it can win you time on two and on uh, nine. But Emil Svensk, you can see he is a European champion and he also, this is his only race of uh, this week, so he's really going to go all out to uh, do his very, very best in this just this one race. Is it an advantage to to not have run this week? It is. A, it is a fairly spread schedule, but still demanding. Oh, interesting. Mm. Mariani was faster there on the route just around. But Hoopman could have gone yeah. a slightly more direct route, I think. Exactly, he, he could have done it a little road. bit better there. So I think it would have been faster if he went the grid option all the way. Um, but to come back to your question, um, yes, it and is an advantage to not have run before, but um, it's not an advantage if you haven't been running due to illness. So it's... <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so Antana Erdem then is the first of the Danes. They I think five of the Danes through to the finals. Really strong results uh, for them. And I think this is the one where they're gonna show it, show their, their strength maybe a little bit more. They're gonna get huge support whenever they come through this arena. This is uh, the sixth control. We're looking for Daniel Hubman. This is Walter Hus. It is Walter Hus, so we have to wait again for Hubman. 
Can we get some runners going in the background, but you've got controls two and three in that direction as well. So we're looking for the Swiss three-time sprint world champion. Well, we will give up waiting for him and uh, instead focus on uh, Lurk Catburn, who uh, he was one of those who fell actually on the knockout uh, sprint. He managed to recover very impressively, make it all the way through to the final as well. So where he finished fifth, so very impressive stuff from the Frenchman. He is absolutely built and uh, he's going to make light work of this sprint, I'm sure. And here, here is he Hopman. Is. Here is Hopman. So we will follow him now under this railway and on his way to the seventh control. And how stressful is it when you have the running cam this close behind you? Um, well, I don't think that he will care. I think it's stressful the first time you have, when you haven't done it and if you don't feel too confident, but I don't think that seriously that he cares about this. He has been in that situation many times and uh, he seems very focused here. Incredibly focused, he always is, Daniel Hubman. He's and a little bit behind Mariani, who had a great start here into this race. But not too far behind, but... This is a good option, and that's it. what we talked about before. He has seen that route here, and he's going there again. This is Mika Kiermula on his way to the first TV split. And he is ahead at uh, the pre-warning. It's looking very, very good for him. At the finish, we've just had our first few finishes. Oh. Mm -hmm. So different route then for to number seven. I wonder if it'll lose many time. And then we will see him as he passes Emil Svens, who's gone the other way. And he is in the lead, a new leading time, but we don't think that's the quickest route that he's going uh, to take there. You let's really mark this. We had 17 seconds. Disadvantage for Hoopman. Joe Lynch then out of the start. Another one of the Kiwis. And back Sorry. again at the start for another of the Swedes, Max Petterbema, part of the gold medal winning sprint relay team. He ran uh, the second leg on that after Lena Strand gave him a huge lead. He was incredibly solid on that one. So uh, maybe slightly underperformed in the qualifier. So too Emil Svensk actually as well. So we will see. They've got a lot of potential to make some really, really quick time. So let's follow Svensk then. Looking very, very strong. We'll see him coming through here. Just we'll check his map maybe for the direction to the next control and we'll follow him all the way through to control number eight. Mm -hmm. Good start, quite okay start here for Emil Svensk, but he's losing time compared to Kirmula. At the same speed, a little bit behind Mariani as well, and also he is going straight, so the left through choice. We've now actually had uh, Francesco Mariani at the finish, and he is uh, not the leader, though. Janis Bonnick has had a good second part. Rootman option, and you can see that now. It's live here. Rootman is actually past Mariani at this point. So let's see, he was four seconds behind. Now he's 15 seconds ahead, so it's a mm -hmm. big difference here. So he was almost 20 seconds faster on this route here. Impressive stuff from Daniel Hubman, managing to see that little passage through the garden. And then, it, as, as I was saying, it's a double win because it's the best route both times. Yeah, but he didn't really execute it well the first time all the way, but he has seen it, and now he could uh, choose it again the second time. Mika Kimmela then here. He is in the lead at this point. Goes through the water. He will soon. He can't read his map at all at this point. It's just running because he's done all the part of the course on that map. He will get a new map just after he crosses the bridge. You can see there is a two people in pink in the map wall. So he will pick that one up there, discard his map, pick up a new one, and then there is a 
about 100 meters of running before the next start, start control. You will, we will follow him here, see how it looks. And then there's a, a very interesting little tricky mm -hmm. first control. It's a rather easy control, but there's a root choice. It's like a little maze mm. up there. And there is Loic Capan. Okay, Capan at number six. Let's see what he can do. Team, you've got to say, have had uh, some quite good results at this uh, World Championship. They were in the top six on the sprint relay, and of course, Lurk managed to get into the final of the knockout sprint as well. Uh, we also had good runs, people like Cecile Calandri as well, a really strong uh, young sprinter. But Catburn is down already. He is slower than Hoos and Mel, and also not the best route choice here either. Okay, back at the start then. Ricardo Rankan from Switzerland. It's very distinctive because he always runs in a cap. If you're spotting him, it's quite easy to, and he looks like he is just getting himself kind of focused on the start line. You see him looking at his compass, got his control descriptions there as well, straight out of the start, folding the map up immediately. Okay, here's Serenton Erdem. He's coming through the uh, arena passage now. He's going to get a huge cheer from the crowd here. And he is down there in fourth position. And you can see that Hootman is only nine seconds behind here at the first TV control. He was 18 seconds behind Kiermula. So uh, it's about nine seconds faster he was there. So maybe that... Uh, Mariani had a little bit of problems there on his route as well, but uh, we can say that it was about 10 seconds faster to go straight on the way to Control 9. Okay, back at the uh, start then, Jakub Blonek from the Czech Republic. As we know, you know, the Czechs have been a strong sprinting nation for many years now. But uh, the man, Wojciech Kral, not on the start list today through illness. And now we can see uh, kind of our, our second TV point here up these stairs, more towards the south end of the map, where they, this is the sequence, as you were saying, in, us in, the, in the map uh, analysis, where they have a few quite easy controls, but you've really got to have good flow. They're very easy controls, so there's no route choice at all. Might be a bit surprising for the runners, but I mean, they will just take it and uh, relax a little bit in their head and maybe uh, read ahead to the next route choice because there's quite an important route choice coming at control 18 uh, later on where you of course can lose time if you pick the wrong one okay ralph street here narrowly missed out on the final of the knockout sprint a couple of days ago he's going to be wanting to put in a really good performance here five brits as well who managed to make it through uh into the final and of course, the team had good performances as well. But Mika Kimmer, is he's still on good speed, we will catch up with his time at the next control. And he was actually in the lead at the first and at the second TV control. So at the first TV control and at the arena passage, and it still looks good here. He will be, take away the lead from Hoopman. It looks good here, but has... Ooh. Four seconds ahead. The lead at the arena passage was nine seconds. And actually, that four seconds that he was ahead is pretty is nearly gone now because he completely stopped at the control. And we were kind of saying this when we ran around. It's, just, it's easy, but the runners aren't expecting it. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. I am absolutely sure because I want to focus on uh, Matthias Kibbert, who's just about to go. Emil Svensko into split two. Fairly easy sequence of controls here, mm -hmm. but but it's it's almost too easy. You don't expect it to be this quick, and I think that's why Mika Kimla was thinking, is there a route choice here? No, there isn't. You just have to kind of go plan A. Yeah, I mean, one, often you have one control or two controls, uh, 
very it's kind of transportation to the next route choice but here you have three or four in a row and, and it's mainly because of the tv pictures i mean if you're honest because they they really wanted to have this nice building in the picture and then <laughs> of course it's a it's a compromise and um it's surprising for the runners but i mean that shouldn't be any problem here we see uh, different route choices. Uh, hard to say which I one they picked. I think most of them have gone the green. Oh no, I think Hoopman maybe went the red. But you can see that <laughs> it's very tight between those runners here. Svensk a little bit ahead, but they are all three quite equal at this point. 18 and here there's an interesting route choice coming. The best thing is, as we mentioned, it's the red route there. All the way around, now we didn't see who picked which, but here we are with Max Pietebey, and he's 13 seconds behind, but only four seconds behind Hoopman at that point. Yeah, Max Pietebey, not a bad start to this sprint final. There's still some time he can catch up. And a uh, runner with a very good start, I think, Ricardo Rankan very soon. As long as he gets control. this uh, this doorway right, it's looking very good. Let's see here, ten seconds left, so might be a little bit behind. Oh. And Hoopman here into the finish. Then let's see what Daniel Hoopman can do. He will go into a clear new leading time. Then Daniel Hoopman just sneaking under the 15-minute mark. Impressive stuff from Daniel Hubman. And just to give you the time from Ricardo Rankan, he punched seven seconds behind Kirmula at the first TV split in position three. So Daniel Hubman will be on the leader's chair then. I wonder how long he will be there. Relatively early starter, but we've got loads who are already out in the field who could do really well. Mika Kimmela is in here then. He's just got two more controls, one more control and then the finish line for him and it's very close. You can see just seconds either side of Daniel Huppen or the leader anyway at each point. So Mika Kimmela, can he take the new leading time here? Really, really fighting hard, and I think he's going to take it. He is rewarded with a new leading time. Just three seconds ahead of Daniel Hubbin, and that disappearing out of picture there is Aston Key. Mm, and he is running fast, Aston Key, once again. From Australia, the youngster here. Coming with this second TV control. He is, a, he is a youngster, but I think he's still the, uh, the oldest in the Australian team. They've got a very young team around. And, you know, I think the more experience they get, the more impressive they are going to be for me. OK, this is Ralph Street. Looking very strong through this particular section. Let's see what the time will be. We'll get that at the next control. I was a bit disappointed after the knockout sprint. He didn't make it to the final. But he's looking good. He uh, lives in Oslo. And uh, we always like to joke by the fact that he's become a sprinter. And this is a good route choice. Yeah, it is a good route choice. He backs out from the control here. Then he will go to this backyard. The same route as we have seen. Hoopman Hoopman also about nine seconds faster on this route. Emil Svensk is already too late to take a new leading time here. He's worked so hard around this one. Uh, but it's not to be, he heads into third. And something we can say now after a few runners in the finish, it's very hard to pick the right route uh, all the time. So I think it will be the runner who has the most of the good decisions today who will end up uh, on top of the race. And here we are with Matthias Kivurts. The knockout sprint world champion from Switzerland. He has really started to make that discipline his own, but will he be able to match the time of Ralph Street, who's currently leading at control number eight? Looking incredibly smooth here, mm. but the time is ticking down. It's not very much time behind, maybe five or six seconds. But we also know that the Ralph Street, he picked a good route to the next one. Not Kibbutz. Not, not as good for Kibbutz. It's only five seconds down now, but we reckon you know, if you, immediately if you don't go that way, you could lose 10 seconds on that route choice alone. Here is uh, uh, Søren Trane Erdem then at the finish for Denmark. 
let's see what he can do. He will get, I'm sure, an extra second of power by the support of the crowd here. It's, it's been really good how many people have turned up this whole week to support their runners. You can just see him losing time on the lead of Mika Kimmler. Every single split control, pretty much. He had a strong finish, but not enough. He will be in fifth place then. So, standings at the finish then. We can take a look at that. Mika Kiermaier, our current leader, just three seconds behind Daniel Hubman. And it's, it's kind of strange running a a sprint final in this way when we're so used to kind of seeing them, deter seeing a start list determined by world rankings, that it's all determined by the, uh, by the result in the qualification. So if you had a bad result, you're gonna start early. But here is Aston Key, look at the times. They are strong here from the Aussie. He is gonna perform very well. He was a fantastic junior, especially in sprint orienting here in Denmark as well taking the title and Aston Key is going to be the new leader here at the finish he is working incredibly hard and he takes the lead a little bit of a fist punch there impressive stuff from the Aussie I think he might have chosen a bit of a bad route choice in the beginning because he was behind but then he really turned up the speed and I mean look at this time if you look at the finish time it's uh, 14.34 usually the winning time is between 14 and 15 minutes so if we oh. look at that, there's a very good chance that he will in, end up in, let's say, the top 10 at least. Double thumbs up from Aston Key. And we have Martin Megborn. You see his little, little steppy steps on his way out. Such as, you know, you completely get thrown out into the course here. It's really hard to figure out where you are. Lots of sharp turns and lots of map reading to do to the first control. And then even more importantly, to that second control as well. Very, very exciting stuff. Okay, we can have a little look. This is uh, how it looks the live on the arena passage. We're actually live with Matthias Kibbert then, who's gone, who's just gone through the and arena passage. At that point, Street was ahead. We can tell you that Kibbutz is still those five seconds behind, so it didn't really matter this route here, at least for those two. So maybe if you really can play out your running speed uh, on the way to nine, it doesn't matter too much, but I still think for most of the runners, the straight route uh, through the backyard will be the best one, the best option. Alexi Niemi out of the start as well. And we're really kind of getting towards the last 12 runners here, those who qualified best, maybe not the, you know, the best ranked in the world, but they had the best qualification races, so they get the privilege of starting towards the end of the list. Here's Tavad Sansad Aidmo, semi-finalist in the knockout sprint. So looks quite fast here. We'll follow him to the first TV splits. He's coming around the corner here, punching at control seven. And this looks good Whoa. for Aidsmo, so maybe a new leading time. We also see that uh, Dulen. Adrien Dulen is in the lead here, so it's one second faster compared to Raul Street. So now it's a shared first position. That's for probably not the quicker route choice there out of that control, I think, as we see Max Petterbema into fourth, just pushing down uh, Emil Svensk. So 26 seconds is the, back, is the gap behind Aston Key. Okay, Gustav Bergman now, and um, more. He's a, he is an all-rounder, but probably stronger in the forest for him. This is his only race of the week. His best result from a sprint. I, I got it as 17th back in 2013. It's now quite we're impressive. with Ralph Street, and he had a good start into this race. So let's see. It. Let's take him to control to the second TV control. So first, it will be this control in front of the building at the top of the stairs and then around the corner here and then we'll get the split time for Ralph Street. He is working really hard. I think he's caught up Jakob Glonek from the Czech Republic. That was, that was the runner ahead of him. So impressive there. And we're going to get his split time next at this control. Also a very good feedback for him, of course, catching the runner in front of him. Maybe in some parts he can kind of take the back here. And yeah. this is the new best time for Ralph Street, four seconds ahead of Aston Key. 
This is Emil Erbro from Denmark on his way to the eighth control. But you can see he is already down on the leaders there. The leader of Adzansan Eidsmo, who we just saw go through. Of course, we are showing these pictures for the Danish crowd. Oh, in the first one, we've actually mm, seen thing here. And here we have the Kibbutz on the way to the second TV control. He it's was behind street. He was five seconds behind street at the arena passage. And the seconds have been very, very close. Maybe losing a bit of time in the beginning, but it's really, really tight, this sprint for me. Incredibly tight margins. Let's see what the time is at the next control then. Mm -hmm. the time is ticking down to that of Ralph Street. We're looking into the right, see him come through. Here he is. Oh, this is tight. Incredibly tight. He's one second behind the Brit. It's incredibly close here from the knockout sprint world champion. Of course, former sprint champion back in 2012 as well. This looks like Lucas Leland. Yeah, you could really see how he was just not pushing very hard here to be sure that he will get the right route to control nine. And unfortunately, Lucas Lila not had the best uh, world championships. These are standing so split too. He was, he made that mistake on the second leg of the sprint relay. But still got a medal. But still got a medal indeed. His team incredibly strong. Martin Regborn then here. And, oh, you could see that pace slow down as he heads into the control to see what he can see. And make the decision, he goes straight on at that point. Ricardo Rankan then into the finish. He lost quite a bit of time here in the second part of the course. It's only 12 seconds behind at the first TV control. And now we follow Alexi Niemi again. And it was good for him at the pre-warning. If you see bottom right of the screen, that control number five. Anything can happen, though, between there. Lots of opportunities, very small margins. Just use a second from hesitation. Coming here, good start for Alexi Niemi. Not taking over the lead, but into a fourth position, shared fourth Ooh, position. But he goes yeah. back out of that control and takes that way. But a couple of seconds lost there, just in that decision making, having to lower the speed, having to turn around the corner. He will wait for Adrien Dulen. The good split at the second at the arena passage, only four seconds behind. Robert Eitzmo. And 13 seconds behind now. But let's see, here's Rolf Street on the way to the finish. Here he goes, he's going to be racing the Aussie Aston Key. It's going to be incredibly close here. He's fighting all the way for the seconds. What will it be? Two seconds slower than Aston Key. And Key maintains that leading position. Incredibly tight stuff. And we know there's lots of good runners. Adrian Delen, Matthias Kiberts to follow. But Gustav Berman has had a good start here. Only one second off the pace. Look how close it is as we see uh, Luca Basse going the other way. Started a little bit uh, later. He, of course, didn't make the finals of the knockout sprint. He was just outside the qualification mark. And you named it. Now we have Rolf Street into second. Soon we will have Matthias Kibbutz on the way to the last control and then to the finish. And here in the arena, the Swiss cowbells are ready. Here he Kibbutz. is. So this is the last control, but it's not it doesn't look good for me. He's not going to take a new leading time. I think he's going to be a few seconds behind the time of Ralph Street as well. So Matthias Kibbutz into third place. And now you can really oh. see how much worth that time of Aston Key is. He had a brilliant run here, really. Yes, to be beating um, particularly Kibbutz, so it just shows it's an incredible run. And for me, Aston looks quite nervous to be waiting for the others. Here's Jakob Edson. And for me, this is one of the, maybe not the favorites, but a very interesting runner today. Will be very motivated to run on uh, home ground here and uh, had a great week so far. Many good performances in the qualification for the knockout sprint, also in the 
sprint relay and then the qualification this morning. Here we can see the different route choices. Avadeit Smu, Aston Key and Ralph Street. See that Ralph Street went straight there. Aston Key taking this extra turn. And they are synced. So it was quite a bit faster actually to go uh, straight there. But we can see that uh, Aston Key must have lost time there at one point because uh, otherwise it can't be like this. That street is so much faster going straight, uh, more or less the, on the same route. So for me, there's opportunities for people like Gustav Bergman to catch a few seconds. We saw some people make the same, but there's an opportunity for others to go faster. This water is deeper than you think, and uh, he makes his way towards the math exchange. We had a strong start from Gustav Bergman. This is his only race of these championships. The only individual race. The only individual race, you're right. So too is Casper Fosser. This is the only, his only individual race. He, of course, uh, won in uh, Boros last month, but questions about his form and not, injury... Not really about the form, more no. about his injury. Well, uh, yes, that's what I mean about the injury. <laughs> questions as to whether he will be able to push it full speed, but if anybody can run through the pain, I've said it before, I'll say it again, if anyone can run through the pain, it's Casper Foster. But we will now take Adrian Delen to the finish. You can see he must have lost a big amount of time between control 13 and 16 there because he is well off this pace. I must have picked the wrong route there. One point. Maybe from 13 to 14 because the other ones were not really route choices. Looks pretty happy that, maybe. Mm. Not sure about that. A bit, a bit, of, a, a bit of a grimace there, maybe. And uh, what a shame to be to be so close at control number eight and then lose some time. It must have been in a route choice or an error or something because he didn't lose too much time in after that mistake either compared to the others. And this is one of the big favourites for me today, Tim Robertson. He was uh, his orienteering style in the knockout sprint was very impressive. He was really he had a lot of trust in his uh, technical skills there. Was doing uh, taking many own route choices. Yeah, and he, he has a silver medal from 2018 in Latvia. He has a bronze medal from the Czech Republic in 2021. I know he wants to, and he wants to win. And here we have an interesting name, Howard Sansa the eight who on the way to the last control. And I think we will have a new leader very soon. I think we will. It's really looking good for the Norwegian. You can see those green colours to the right. He is really being incredibly strong in the finish here. And the time looks good as it ticks down towards the line. Just the power of this athlete into the line, and it is a new leading time. Congratulated, congratulated by Aston Key, who vacates the leader's chair. It is now Edmo who is going to take that spot. He is a, was a semi finalist in the knockout sprint, and we can maybe have a little look here at how it was done. None of them had the really the fastest route to 19. But then here, it's so hard to say the gaps here. I mean, no, no problems, no different route choices as far as I can see. Just some incredible pace through that, through the little passages, turning the sharp left and then right into control 21 and made it really work hard. Okay, Gustav Bergman will take him to our tech second TV split, which for the men is control number 16. Mm, and you uh, can see he had some whoa. good speed there. He was almost uh, about the same running speed as eight smooth so far. With all of the split times. And radio controls, there was a crash, or at least almost a crash. If you're out shopping in Vila today, you've got to be aware. Mm. Ten seconds left for him to take over the lead here. It'll be very tight. I think he might be a few seconds behind at that point. So he lost a little bit of time from uh, the pre warning towards this TV control. But if you compare it to a street and key, it's look, still looking very good. OK, here's Florian Hovald. His best result was last year with a sixth place. 
And mm. is he an outside shot? The last hope for the Swiss runners here today. But here's Casper Foster. What can he do? And you can see at control five, he had a five seconds lead. Watching at control seven here. We'll take him through to control number eight. It's looking good for Foster. It's looking really good for Foster. He and just the... looks up maybe to see the next route. You can see how flat and how still he's holding his map. Uh, oh, a little see, bit of indecision. But you can see that he, he spotted the other route as well. It's yeah. just a decision thing here. Yeah, he had he went there in the first the first time. You see that both Aitsmu and Foster went straight there and both of them, I mean they're first and second to the first TV control. So it's definitely a good choice to go through this backyard. And not then splitting up there, you can see it's just the uh, higher speed, the higher running speed there by Kasper Foster. Here's our second to last starter. He was fourth the last two times we've had a Sprint World Championship. He is desperate for a medal and he has pinned all his hopes, individually at least, on this uh, individual sprint. It didn't run the knockout. He's an incredible track athlete as well. And we will follow Martin Regborn then into the finish, but he is late. He will get into the fifth spot. So is the top Swede at the moment, but we have Gustav Bergman very, very shortly, I think, into the finish. And here's the last starter. Fourth is also his best at the uh, world champs level. Third is best at the European champs. And I was chatting to him yesterday after the knockout and he was saying this is really a better distance for him. He doesn't feel like he's got, you know, 1500 meter pace that you need for a knockout sprint. He really feels that for him, it's his 5K, 10K pace that can pull him round a course like this. And he'll, he tends to oh, work into it. And look at well. this. This, I think, will be an advantage for Gustav Bergman. Let's see here. My feeling is that he will come to this uh, 19th control with a big. A bit of an advantage, oh, it's but it's slim. very tight. It's very tight here. It's very so tight. So very soon to the last control and, and the fight here. for the lead here. Here he is. Can Gustav Bergman take the lead away from Hovard Sansar? Yes, the, he the, can. The, the gap is good on the split. And Gustav Bergman is going to be racing for a new leading time here from Sweden. He is really working hard. It will be a new leading time. That's very impressive. That's very impressive. It's the first one we have seen with this good route at the very end. And he seems to have chosen very, very good all the way. So that's, uh, this will be hard to beat, definitely. Tim Robertson, oh, goodness me, what has happened to Tim? Because he is 44 seconds. Oh my gosh, let's have a look at what happens. we'll get the answer very soon. He sees this. Oh, he's running into the wrong passage oh. there has to back out ah this is yeah that's the time time loss here i mean that's the risk if you take this route you have to be very sure where you enter <laughs> Julian Hovald. let's see what he it's can late. do also behind ah but he takes a good route choice here See the way he kind of angled in that to that control and turned around. It's always quicker, of course, not having to turn around, but this looks like it was the shorter route choice. Here's Yannick Mikels then, and he's on his way to control number seven. Mm, let's see if he's one of the big favorites who can uh, be close, but he is 10 seconds behind at control five already. Let's see. Turns around, you can see wasn't him checking the, his map. Wasn't the best route here to this control either. And he's already slower than that time of Casper Fosser, mm. who we haven't seen through at the uh, second kind of spectator control yet. But a good route choice here, even if he is 12 seconds behind. And this looks very good for Gustav Bergman. He seems to be satisfied as well. 
He's such a perfectionist with his races. He, uh, he, he will know exactly where he has done well, where maybe he's lost time. As we follow Luca Basse then, but mistakes, mistakes on the course from Basse, from the Frenchman. He, I talked to him after he was part of the Kimila winning team and he was really saying Forrest is his, his strength. So it's been unusual for him to focus so much on sprint this year, but he's not happy, I think, with that route choice. Looks over to see Gustav Berman as the leader. Not good for him. Here's Chris Jones, though. What has he done? Chris Jones, I think, always makes the running look... He always looks like he's running slowly for me, but he's just... It makes it look very this easy. This will be interesting now. He can definitely be a threat for Gustav Berman. So he's... Oh, look at this. <laughs> it's a big lead there at Control 13. It's a green card for Kasper Fossa. And you can see that two of the runners who weren't running the knockout sprint now in the lead here. At this point of the sprint. Kasper Foster and Gustav Berryman. And this will definitely be a new best time yeah. at this second TV control. He has control got 16. seconds to spare here. Kasper Foster, the gap is 16 seconds. And we've seen the margins are so tight, but mm. not for this Norwegian. We know region. there was one route choice, and we know that from control 18 to 19, that Gustav Berryman chose a very mm. good route. It'll be interesting to see what uh, Fosper will choose there. Maybe we'll see it here. It's a whole control ahead of Bowman. That's just impressive stuff. I hope we will stay a little bit longer on the GPS just to see which direction Fosper will exit this control. I think he will turn up there. And where but we I saw don't, still Bowman don't think the straight north there, didn't we, pretty much? The, the difference is not 16 seconds, even though... I think it's a little bit faster to go the way Berman did, but maybe it's only, I think it's about like three or four seconds. <laughs> so it, this looks very, very, very good for Kasper Fosser. Well, a lot of this sprinting is just not about taking the, the, the worst route choice all the time. You've got to take the maybe the, the second best one sometimes always, always works. Gustav is uh, celebrating with his family. Here's Ricardo Scalette then. He's the fifth last starter through split number two. We will follow him through. Ah, oh, he's too far behind here. Still, it's, I mean, it's a good race. Uh, he's in position nine here so he's still on the way maybe for a top 10 yeah Let's exit ah not the best exit here he will lose a few seconds he, it was great to see him take that medal in the on italian soil in that middle distance race right at the back end of last year Thomas Krifta on the way to the finish what can the czech athlete do here because he's already top ten. yeah looking for a top 10 result and fighting hard here into the finish line. Takes up a lot on his shoulder, you can see. Now we've got the pre-warning for Casper Fossa, so we will see him very shortly into the finish. In fact, we will follow him a long Look way, I think, speed at the back here. here. This looks really good. Now our running camera ops have to work really hard to try and keep up with him. He is on his way to control number 21, and the gap is looking good. You can mm. see there, green card all the way. And he has about 50 seconds to go to the finish. There's a very sharp turn you have to take here. That's why he goes out to the right. He's already well prepared, this one, going round here into the control itself. And now the cheers are here in the arena for Kasper Fossa. I think for Jakob Etzen, who is on the way to the finish he is, here. So but he'll be followed very shortly by Kasper Fossa. Here's the Norwegian. He is working really, really hard to set a new fastest time. He has led all the way around this course. Kasper Fossa crosses the line. He's looking odds on to be the next world champion in sprint orienteering. There are only five men behind them. One of them is here, Florian Hovald. 
But there, I don't see anyone who can be a threat here. Maybe, maybe Chris Jones. But I mean, from the others, I think this looks it looks very, very good for Casper Foster. What a I mean, now we have to say it was a good decision for him to skip yes. the knockout sprint. Um, if you can come back like this and take the lead by 16 seconds. And I mean, there's another gap from position two to position three between Gustav Bergman and uh, Ovet Eitzmo. It's another 13 seconds there. So it's 29 seconds he has to the third place. Here's Yannick Mikhail's second to last starter, but you can see he's late compared to the time of Casper Fosser. But he's if... maybe a threat for Gustav Bergman. Yeah, can he get ah. in amongst the medals? Not if he does things like that. Losing a second here and there, but his time, 21 seconds. A couple of seconds behind Gustav Bergman, who is currently second in the finish. And here we have Chris Jones, Yannick Michels, and... Uh, Kasper Foster, together in this picture, maybe the runners who are fighting for the medal here. And you see that it's clear lead for Foster, but behind there, it's actually quite tight. And we also know that there is a fight for the medal between Michels and Berryman, so Berryman would be in this group as well. Here we have him, Chris Jones, on the way Chris. to the second TV split. He is the last starter then today, so that he knows there's nobody behind him. His finish position will be his result. He's already behind Foster, but can he sneak then into second place at this point? It's looking good for second there, comfortably ahead of Oudsmo, five seconds there, and we'll see what he can do in the last stages of this race. We follow Chris Jones then. Around through to the control number 17 there. You just see it on the left and number 19. He's looking very carefully yeah, at the, the route choice. Yeah, exactly. A lot of map reading there. And we know that there is not many route choices coming at the com like the following two controls. So my guess is that he's already preparing the route to control 19, which of course is a very smart thing to do at this point of the race. Standings at split two then, with everybody having gone through. Here is Tim Robertson, and we will take him through to the end. We saw a big, big mistake. He ran into the wrong garden on his way to control number two. He lost about 40 seconds. And for me, I mean, what do you do when you've done that? You, you kind of know your race is over, don't you, really? Yeah, definitely. He knows that uh, he's not good for a medal today. And it, it's, a, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough one for him. A really, really tough one, I feel, for Tim Robertson. He's really had good form this year, but not to be, not getting all the orienteering rights. Commiserations then for Tim. He will not be happy. I think he expected a lot of himself uh, after this race being in such yeah. good form, but no. He's... could see in his body language that he knew that there's no chance for a medal today. But now uh, let's focus for the fight for the medals here, Yannick Michels and uh, Chris Jones. First to the finish, Florian Hovart. Florian Hovart there, and you can see he's already late, but he's looking for a top 10 result here. Will he be able to take that? Of course, his best result was sixth place back in 2021. He's going to be slower than that, but still a top 10 result in the world is incredibly impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. And now very soon, very, very soon, we will know the medalist. Uh, because here is Yannick Michels on the way. Here is the Belgian. He's looking for medals here. And he lost time there in the end, 24 seconds. That's not good enough to be Gustav Bergman, but let's see in the finish. It may well still be good for a medal though. Yannick Michels racing into the finish here. What can he do? He just is going to sneak out the Norwegian, so third place currently. So it's oh. definitely a medal for Gustav Bergman because there's only one runner to come and it's Chris Jones. So we wait for Chris Jones now and Yannick Mikkels is kind of looking for any indication as to what he's done. I can see the Brits are standing by the last control, ready to cheer in this man, Chris Jones. And it's the fight, Chris Jones against Bergman and also against Mikkels. I think he will beat Michels. Will he beat Gustav Berryman? We know Berryman is 16 seconds behind in the finish, so he has to speed up a little bit here. So it's going to be seconds in it for the silver and the bronze here for Chris Jones. The this Brits will be there, so tight. Chilliman. It's going to be incredibly tight. What can Jones do? He puts his foot on the gas. Will he get the silver? Will he get the bronze? It's not going to be good enough for the silver. He will, though, get a medal. He gets that bronze medal. And he 
is very <laughs> satisfied with that. Very, very happy with that. He oh. holds the two medalists. I'm so happy for him. He was such an active runner in the sprint relay, and he was such an active runner in the knockout sprint as well. Very well deserved medal, and uh, all of the three medalists today were very impressive in their route choices. Uh, maybe the one who impressed more, most of them, uh, uh, when it, like route choice wise, for me it was Gustav Bergman. He oh, almost picked all of them right, and uh, but you can see that Casper Foss is just uh, such an incredible speed throughout the whole course. It's kind of you can kind of get two way vibes when he's running. <laughs> Uh, you see him and it's like on rails, There's, oh. you never get the feeling that something could happen to him. He makes it look incredibly easy and he's not even probably in the, in the best shape for him with his injuries that he's had. But he's such a championship performer, he really knows how to deal with the big occasion. And if you remember, this is only his third ever world championship and the first one he did when he was a junior. Then he had a year out with, you know, COVID, no, uh, uh, no races really at all, and incredible. And the first one he did and almost became the long distance world champion as well. So it's, uh, well, this, I don't know where this will end with him uh, after his career. He has so many years to come and he already now is so dominating in all of the disciplines. I mean, all from sprint to middle distance and uh, long distance he can win. He can win everything. If if Casper Fosser stays reasonably injury free, if he has that motivation to well, keep on Obviously he doesn't hard, even have to be injury free. Well I mean free. exactly. If he keeps on working hard and he can find that motivation, he's gonna have uh, be full of medals. He's gonna have a have mm. to get a big trophy cabinet. And you can see here So uh, we can see here all three of the medalists. They took this route choice, the straight one, as we mentioned before, and expected to be the fastest. Then different route to control four. It's very hard to say which route is the fastest because the GPS is just lagging in some parts. Now we have Michels in. And uh, now also we know why we have a change here. Chris Jones disappeared from the results, so they are double checking the results. So now we have also Michels here in this comparison. And we see that the only one going through the backyard there is Yannick Michels, and all the others were going more to the east there. So now here at the Arena Passage, you can now we can see this route choice here for the first time, all of them going up straight there. Punching control 12, and here you can see really how big the gap already is between Fosser and the others. It's kind of the, I mean the, the race more or less was decided that the Arena Passage, not really, I mean he could have missed, but there he had such a big gap that he even even if he would have missed one of the route choices here in the end uh, he would still have the chance to win this and it's just I mean it's mostly physically he's so dominant and here but we're coming up to this interesting route choice this one tonight mm, now look at the route here by Gustav Berryman I think this is a very clever one to take it's actually the only one going for this one you can really see that there are different options. You can see Jones going to the very south. But I don't know at one point if maybe Chris Jones missed to punch one of the controls. I haven't seen anything here, maybe 19, but it can't be really because the women, they have almost the same course here. Now we go to an interview with Kasper Fosser. Kasper, you're the world champion. Tell us uh, about your feelings right now. Uh, it's uh, oh, it's really amazing. I uh, I still can't believe it. It's like the 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 start of the season was so difficult with me with my 
my injury and uh, the last couple of weeks have been uh, really tough. I had to drop the knockout, knockout sprint because uh, because I uh, I was afraid that I would have too much pain today if I ran a knockout. So this was my only chance to be uh, an individual world champion this year, and uh, I was like uh, I, I felt like a uh, nerve wreck on the start, and uh, it's such a such a good feeling to uh, to have made it, and uh, I'm just really really relieved. What was the race like? It was, uh, it was. I think it was really clean race for me. I, uh, it was super intense, orienteering and uh, difficult uh, all the way. So, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to stay controlled and uh, and always make sure that I had considered considered all routes and uh, knew exactly where to go around each turn and uh, and yeah, it was, uh, it was a perfect race. I, uh, I'm really, really happy about this. Congratulations. Thank you. Interesting stuff and we have a change to the results because unfortunately Chris Jones has missed punch. We didn't get the punch from him at control number 12. So that puts him disqualified with Yannick Michels into the bronze medal position then. An upgrade for Belgium, his first ever uh, medal at the World Championships and the top three then Fossa, Bergman, Mikels. We will get them at the flower ceremony in just a few moments time. Any other results you want to pick out Jonas at this point? Well I mean we haven't been talking a lot of, about Yannick Michels yet and uh, he was just longing for this medal and now he gets it. Maybe he would have wished to get it in a different way but I mean uh, still this is great. It's a medal for Belgium and uh, a great run for him. He was in the fight for the medals all the way, so here we get him in the picture as well. Very well deserved. He has been close very many times. Also, Aston Key on the fifth spot is very impressive. Harvard Eight's move was very, mm. a very good run there. Mm. Ralph Street had a good run as well. I mean, all the top 10 guys, you can really see <laughs> that you need to have a very good run. Uh, maybe one of the runners in the top 10 he would have liked to be a bit higher up is Matthias Kibbutz. Mm -hmm. um, he won the knockout sprint, now he ends up in 7th position. Of course 7th is a good position but he's 44 seconds behind so it's quite a gap and I think he would have wished to be a little bit closer. Also nice to see a top 10 for Denmark, uh, Jakob Edson on 10th position. Okay, so we will do the flower ceremony, at least when we get Kasper Fosser for here for the flower ceremony. But we will start nevertheless. We've got a couple of moments before Kasper needs to be here. Yannick Mikkels, a shake of the head here. Last minute upgrade for him. As a heartbreak for Chris Jones, and uh, he's been aiming for this one for so long, this individual sprint medal. It's not the circumstances, uh, Jonas, you said that he would have wanted to take this medal to see a, a fellow runner disqualified, but of course... A bronze medal is a bronze medal, that however way you win it, it's an incredible thing for him. Second place, the uh, sprint focus this year has paid off. He is much more comfortable, I think, in the forest, but has proved himself here today. But to take another world title, Casper Foster proving he can do it once again after his wins also in the World Cup. Uh, he must now, of course, be the World Cup leader as well. Although, of course, he didn't, didn't get a result in the knockout sprint. But impressive stuff, really dominant and incredible running from Casper Foster. We will confirm the results uh, very shortly before there is the, the medal ceremony. It just allows any teams to make any protests or anything like that. But there, of course, are the top three. Casper Foster, the risk to just focus on the individual has paid off. And 
celebration then <laughs> for the bronze medal for Yannick Michels. What a, a, an afternoon of ups and downs of emotions for him. Yeah, and also that he was uh, saying something interesting in an interview before that, uh, I mean, many of the runners have been focusing on sprint now for uh, a year uh, since the last World Championships. And that's actually something he has done for 10 years yes. now. So he, he says that this, of course, those 10 years uh, of difference of focusing make him a very strong sprint runner. And you could, yeah, you could see that today. It's orienteering remains a game of experience. Experience counts so much. It is so valuable for the runners, for the athletes, to be faced with different types of terrain, different challenges, different stresses, and then to be able to perform where it really matters as well. have some confirmation very soon of what happened then to Chris Jones. It's been heartbreak for him at several mm, occasions. Can, I look back to Latvia as well. You can, well, see, it you can see it here. He missed control three. Let's see here, second control. I think he goes so back hard. out the same way. Yeah, and then goes to the fourth control directly. So he skipped control three. So very tough for him, but of course, I mean, there's, there are some extra seconds there if you have to pass control three, so it's not that he, uh, I mean, if he would have passed control three, he would have missed the medals also, so it's, yeah, in a way, maybe this will be better for Yannick Michels to kind of get the, the feedback that it's not due to just a punch that isn't given on the card, but it's really to a missed control, but of course, it doesn't make it better for Chris Jones. Absolutely not. Okay, we will move then on to the women's course. A whole other set of 45 runners to take their way through the course and through all the orienteering that we have here again. Those who are starting last are the top qualifiers and we will have a look at the women's course. Mm, once again, of course, it's the same start for the women. We've seen it. It's not in the arena. Then the same route, one to two, where we have seen all of the top runners. They're going straight through this backyard, this yellow area there. Then the second control, we just jump over a loop in the men's course and go to three, four, five. It's From there, it's the same course. And of course, they don't have to flip the map because they don't have as many controls in this first part. So they don't have kind of two map changes, only one at the arena passage at the point we are now. And they have a, exactly the same loop also on this second part. Control eight, nine, and then this root choice to 10, another root choice to 11. And then here we are at the second TV control at control 13. It's the same TV control we have seen in the men's race. 14, 15, uh, easy controls, 15, 16, the opportunity to go to the left as Gustav Bergman in the men's race. Good route there. 17, it's more or less uh, just the left right route choice and then back to the finish. Uh, so, a very similar course to the men's compared to the men's one, a little bit shorter in the beginning, but from the second control, we will see yeah, the same controls in the women's course as in the men's course. Yep, so we'll have a look at the start list here. Great to see an athlete from Japan making it into this uh, final. Fantastic stuff and a big range of nations that we've seen make it through. Uh, anybody you're going to want to highlight? Well, of course, uh, we kind of have to highlight now Yves van Donk in uh, start number 16. Uh, I wonder if she will be as hot today as she was two days ago because it's an individual sprint. She hasn't been actually orienteering for such a long time. She started in 2018. Yes. Um, so she has a only, Swedish partner. Yeah, but if we see that uh, what kind of development she has been taking in within four years, if we look four years ahead, it would be <laughs> very inter interesting to see her. But then, of course, the big favorites in the very end. 
and uh, the biggest name, of course, Tove Alexandersson uh, from Sweden. Um, yeah, I mean, what else to say? She's the big favorite, and uh, my guess is that she has to miss quite many controls here to not win this. But everything can happen. Uh, we have seen that in the men's race, and if you would ask Chris Jones, then he would confirm that. Yeah, he absolutely would. But we uh, want to start here with this athlete you just mentioned, Yifan Dongen. She is from the Netherlands. She picked up a bronze medal in that knockout sprint. And, of course, that will have given her a whole load of confidence. Uh, but it's very different the individual compared to yeah, knockouts. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at the Swedish Championships, she has been running. Uh, she was also very competitive in the, in the individual sprint. Uh, even though it's, but of course, the yeah, the course here is much, much more intense than the one they had at the Swedish Championships. But I mean, it shows that she she is a very solid orienteer in sprint orienteering and otherwise she wouldn't be there in the knockout sprint either because even if you are in a group and you kind of can take the back of the runners you still have to see the different options to choose the right back and uh, only i mean you have to be a very good orienteer to to be able to see the fastest through choices and uh, then also run as fast as the others I think that is Tekla Emilia Gvildita of Lithuania on the arena passage here. Going to exchange a map and we can uh, immediately have a look at a few of these route choices from a, a few of the early starters. Robertson, Laura Robertson manages to take that good route choice. Uh, but then she's going to the Hoopman choice there, I guess. Maybe it's hard to say from the GPS here. Oh, here's Florence Tanoe from France. Yeah, almost missed out on this one. This is Tibet control number four. Almost all of the runners we have seen running here. It, I think it's all, it was only Yannick Michels we have seen coming from the other direction to this uh, TV split. leader at this point and now it goes for fifth. Yeah, it's uh, Hedvig Valbjörn Judesen from Denmark leading at first TV control. See Susanna Kovacova from Slovakia. She made it into the semi-finals a couple of days ago in the knockout. Adela Finsulova was Adela Indrakova on her way through the arena passage and she is exactly the same time as Laura Robertson in the lead. Laura Robertson arrived here in Denmark last night after last minute issues. I think it was with a visa, so she only got the confirmation she was able to get to Denmark yesterday morning. So not the ideal preparation for her, a lot of stress, but I'm really glad to see that she was able to make it into this final. And you can say that she, Laura Robertson, she lost five seconds from the first TV control to the arena passage compared to Adela Finsterlova. And here we have Ivan Dongen. What can the Dutch woman do? She's going to make a miss. No, she just goes the yeah. uh, Yannick Michels route into the fourth control. And I know there was loads of people very happy to see her take that bronze medal. There's a lot of people interested in seeing the medals be distributed to more nations, I think, in orienteering to get that, that interest and not see the domination from the, the Scandinavian and the, the Swiss teams like we've often seen in the forest. Oh, she nearly misses there. And we'll see what she's able to do compared to Gudeson. Just a little bit behind here. Still okay, three seconds behind at that point. We also seen that Finstelova was able to catch a few seconds between the first and the second TV split or between the first TV split and the arena passage. Now, Ben Lahayu has had a series of top 10 finishes at the Sprint World Championships throughout her career. And it'll be great to see her back up there again today. She's such a solid and consistent performer. And we've seen from the men's race how much experience counts, and she's got that. Mm -hmm. 
Here we have the comparison between Van Donchen and Gudesen. We see that it's a good route choice by Van Donchen. Of course, it's also uh, maybe not the, the best execution in this part there. It would be better to head a little bit to the south just after this passage with the backyard and then head to this passage closer to the red line. Then he saw this small mistake there, hesitation just before the entrance to control five. And they split up here. Not really on the same route. I think they are on the same route. It's a yeah. GPS tracking that's just quite off, but it looks like Van Donken in the lead here. I think it's comfortable for her at this Seems point. Seems to have a pace. bit of a faster pace here. So we know the tracking is slightly behind real time, so I think we will follow Van Donken into the sixth control and see her maybe through the arena passage. But we will head back to the start for Cecile Calandri, who is a really strong French sprinter. Mm, she had a good run in the sprint relay. She finished 13th last year at the World Championships as well. One of the runners, you, could, you can really feel that uh, She's getting better and better with every year. Yeah, she's really on an upward trajectory. And this is Ifan Dongan. Let's see what her time is then. When she hits this, it's a new leading time then here for the Dutch athletes. She'll get a lot of support here. She's now become a bit of a name. Oh, she's taking a bath the there. Taking a bath indeed. It's quite nice to have the cooling effect of this water. It's good for her that she can change the map now yes. directly after this, otherwise the plastic would be filled with water. OK, back to the start, though. Carolina Jutterup. Mm, the second of the Danish runners. Yeah, three Danish women in this final. It'll be uh, Ida Egvig Christensen, the third of the, the trio. Here's Van Lahayu on her way to the fourth control. You can just see how much she's got her head down, looking at that map, making sure she is checking the routes through, trying to store as much information in her head as possible see quite uh, many more women taking this route here compared to the men's race. Turning now towards the first TV split and you see that uh, the leader there, Anna Isabel Toledo Navarro from Spain. Very good start. So you know, she's not taking over the lead here. And Lario, four seconds behind. Back at the start for a very interesting young runner from Switzerland, Alina Gempeler. Her first start at the World Championships. 12th place in Burgos, the World Cup, just a month ago. Of course, no Natalia Gempeler, her stepmom here, who, because she is Russian, um, she is not allowed to race. I think she is trying to uh, be able to race for Switzerland in the future. She is. Uh, Married to a Swiss, lives there. She's got the Swiss passport, but she's not running. She's not a part of the Swiss team yet. Oh, and you can see interesting route there. We have Lahariu running to the south. And uh, you can see that Toledo Navarro really executed this route very well. And that's also the reason why she's in the lead at control five at the First TV split. That also, then she is to control four. She actually picked all of the route choices very well here in the beginning, and here she is in the picture. Yeah, here she is in the picture, and it's looking incredibly good for the Spaniards. She goes into the lead here, and uh, Toledo, who was in the semi final at the uh, knockout sprint, is looking very good for Spain. That's really very impressive, good, very stuff. impressive start here. 
mean, we were talking about the, that before the race, that it's really, when you have a tricky race like, like this, and you have so many options and as kind of so many possibilities to pick the wrong route, uh, there's, it really opens up for kind of uh, an outsider to get uh, at least into the top 10, because if you manage to pick all the right route choices all the time, uh, you can kind of save a lot of time and energy there. You absolutely can. So these are the standings at the split control number one. That's control number five for the women's. And uh, Isabel Toledo is our current leader. Still incredibly close. Our leader at the finish is Hedvig Valbjörn Gudesen. But Yves Dongen will be through shortly as well. That's Ven Lahayu at the Arena Passage. She was in second place at that point, but we will follow the Lithuanian. Vildita into the finish as well. She is too far behind. It's a big gap between uh, places one and two at the moment. Uh, Gudison, the Dane, and Robertson, the uh, New Zealander. Behind her big Gudison from Denmark. Okay, here's Eve van Dongen, and we will take her through to our second TV split. It's number 13 for the women. We can see at the Arena Passage, she's eight seconds behind, and Isabel Toledo Navarro. But she compared to Gudesen, she is nine seconds ahead there. Lost some time here in the second part. And now she lost yeah. the lead here. It's Gudesen in the lead, Danish lead here. So not the lead. Such a great start. She picked pretty much all the best route choices through to the arena passage, but you've got to do good all the way through. Finchlova, can she make it into the top two? She will, yep, she won't beat Gudison, still our leader, still the leader at the second TV split as well. And the Czech athlete goes into second place. Here's Susan Lush. Mm -hmm. On the way to the second split. At the arena passage, she was 10 seconds behind. And Isabel Toledo Navarro. And uh, she was, let's see. She was ahead, seven seconds ahead of Gudesen, but also she lost time, so very good uh, second part here by the Danish runner. Yeah, incredible second half of the course from the Dane. She still has a lead of 18 seconds at the finish. And at the moment we've seen a lot of the women do this control in the way that we think is the best, which is to run straight through it, through it instead of uh, backing up and going round the other way. A, a big time loss here. by Anna Wisniewska, two minutes so behind the leader. Here we are with Karoline Götterup at the arena control. Into an eighth position, 15 seconds behind but Ana Isabel Toledo Navarro. But two seconds ahead of Gudesen, our current leader. Mm -hmm. That's what is interesting to see, though. And let's see if she can uh, defend the lead against the Spanish runner in the picture. And uh, Isabel Toledo Navarro on the way to the second TV control now. She, oh, she lost right. a bit she of lost time a there. Bit of time here. A really good second part there, or first part of the second loop for <laughs> Gudesen. So we will get Toledo at the next uh, split.
Maybe a small hesitation. For me, she's not got as good a flow. I think we will see others do this control with more pace. And she... Uh, you can see here Gudesen now. Let's see what she did better than everyone else. Different route choice to 10. And then a good route choice here to 11. It's the one that was marked as the shortest one in the preview. So that, I guess that's the point where she was able to catch a few seconds compared to the other ones. So Toledo took the lead, but will that be very shortly and swiftly overtaken by Ven Lahayu? Yeah, it looks good for the Finn. It looks, especially it looks a little bit faster, just physically, that mm. she's faster running, better speed here. And here is Yves van Donkel. Okay, what can she do? The time ticks down. Will it be enough to take a new leading time? I think it's going to be tough. Although, look, you can see they've got the same time, the control 18. She will be cheered into the finish and to the finish line. Where will she place compared to second place? One second behind the Dane. Oh, tight stuff at this point in the race. And I think for the, for the women's, if you look down the start list, it's the women are more consistent than the men, I think we really do. Whereas in the men's class, we had a lot of really top runners starting kind of in the middle of the pack. I think we will really see those in incredibly top We are building up the excitement. Right at the end. It's, it's good to build up the excitement. If I only told Alex Anderson was starting last, but hey, <laughs> I shouldn't complain, should I? And here we are with Caroline Olsson. It's very, very disappointed after the knockout uh, qualification where she missed the control. Then got the chance to jump in here. I'm sure she feels like she's got a, a lot to prove. She was sixth. Her best result is from sixth in Latvia 2018. And it's uh, close-ish at that first control. But she, I think, maybe was a late replacement or maybe wouldn't be picked first for this no, she, she replaced Hannah Lundberg. Exactly. She's injured. And we must say Lena Strand uh, was feeling not very well. She had a sore throat, so she's been replaced by Sarah Hagström. So all change on the Swedish team, but they're so strong and, you know, they, they have a great team, uh, whoever they pick. So confirmation then, the top 10 at the finish at the moment, still the Dane in the lead, but we have got a long way to go. This looks like Alexandra Hornick. No, it's Agatha Lesnik, sorry. They look uh, quite similar from, uh, from behind. They have the same running kit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's also true. Yeah. They have similar hairstyle as well. Come on, let me ask. <laughs> Maybe we can give you a bit of information from the arena passage. There we have Ida Agerby Christiansen on position two and Inka Nurminen from Finland in the first position now. This is Karin Götterup on the way to the second TV control and then uh, in a few seconds I think we will expect Eline Kempele there. But, uh, here's Toledo through to the finish then. Gudesen still the leader. How will she compare to Gudesen and Van Donken? She looked quite fatigued, I think, through the second TV split. But There's she is chance here really to take powering up the running. Oh, will it be a new leading time here? Oh, it is by one second. Oh, congratulations to Toledo Bear. New leading time here by just one second. But will her joy on the lead and the time on the leader's chair be short lived? Here's Ven Lahayu. The time is looking very good for Ven Lahayu here. She punches the control, and I think this will be a very easy new leading time here for Ven Lahayu. Incredible stuff. And this is now a real 
difference between Hario and Toledo, almost half a minute. Meanwhile, we have uh, Caro Olson at the Arena Passage, 17 seconds behind. We also had Eline Gempele at the second TV control. She punched there in a new best time, three seconds ahead of Enla Hario. You can see here, GPS comparison. You can also see that Gudesen again had a very good route there to control 16. Uh, but it, we have also to mention that the uh, route choice by Venla Hario is almost as quick as the one we get us, and I think it differed around three seconds when we tested it, so it's quite similar. There's a lot of route choices that are only a couple of seconds apart, but it's those couple of seconds that win you a medal or don't win you a medal, so um, you've really got to pick right all the time. Ingrid Lundinez. But we'll she's behind. She is behind. Maybe looking for a top 10 position as she goes through this second split. So into seventh then. Sarah Hagström through to the arena. Mm, but she's already a few seconds behind here. She was a finalist in a knockout sprint. Has all those races in her legs. But you can see maybe a, a route choice error to control in the first part. She was 20 seconds behind there. She's managed to catch up some time afterwards. So opportunity to catch up some more time later on in this race. So short though, just the time runs out. Still Still laundry. Pretty good for the athlete from France. Fast finish and she will go equal third then with Giddeson. And this is Ida Agerby Christiansson. A good race so far. Maybe with a chance for a second position to the second TV split. Let's see, she will be there in a few seconds. So Gembler's time, just over the 11 minute mark there. What can Christiansson do? Checking her codes. Mm, checking it very. Carefully. Ooh. Ah, that's not a good route. That is not a good route. They're not good to miss a couple of seconds there. Yudurup, Carolina Yudurup is in the finish here. Cheered through to second place. Oh, she then. had a good finish here. Mm. Was able to get a bit closer. This is Inka Nurmenen. And uh, this will maybe be a new best time here. She had a Good lead all the way from control six. And we'll be at the second TV control just in a short while. And meanwhile, we have Eline Kempele on the way to the finish. And this will be a new best time. A new best time for Switzerland and for Eline Kempele. Solid work there and she have a look, picked up some time. She was behind Ben Lahayu. If we look at the arena passage, a really good second half. I mean, maybe we can see what happens. Take a look here. Similar route choices. Then we are in this quite easy part here. 12, 13, 14, 15. See the route here. All three of them going on the same route. But it is a little bit of an advantage there for Gempele compared to Agerby Christiansson. <laughs> okay, Carolyn Olsen here. But you look at the split times and she is dropping time all the way through here for me. 30 seconds down at control 10. 
She's got such a familiar running style. Full of motivation to make up from the missed punch in the knockout sprint qualification. And dropping even more time there. Now 41 seconds behind. Ingrid Lundelez into the finish. It's eighth spot for her. And not satisfied. 44 seconds behind. Immediately look and see if there were some better route choices there. <laughs> So Alina Gempela is on the leader's chair. Her time, 14 minutes and 57 seconds. This is uh, Alexandra Ornik. Now, <laughs> now, it, really, now yeah. it really is <laughs> But she is, uh, yeah, already these 40 seconds down is not where she wants to be. She uh, managed to make it into the semi-finals. In fact, she was seventh in the sprint in 2021. So maybe a bit of a disappointing start for her. And this is uh, Ida Agavi Christiansen now on the way to the last control and the finish. But she's late compared to Eleni Gempele, but oh, maybe a second. Oh, misses the control as well. Oh, tough stuff. But she is going to be behind, I think, maybe the time of Pauly as well. I think she might have lost. Oh, she didn't lose four seconds there. But for sure, one or two seconds towards the last control into a third position. Here's Alice Leek of Great Britain. Ah, she was only two seconds behind. Getting closer and closer. In Kana, no, Emma Biesmo was the lead at the Arena Passage where you have... Oh, that's not control number 10, that's control, another control. <laughs> but Alice Leek, can she take a new leading time here? Yes, she can. She needs to continue though. And here we are with Elena Roos to the Arena Passage. Punching into fourth oh. position, only three seconds behind. And you can see that Benjaminsen also is up there, only one second behind. In Kinnaman and then into the finish. She was faster than Alina Gempela at earlier stages, but has not had a good second part of this race. She is dropping down and will be just a third. One second ahead of Christiansen, who's sitting there next to her. And here we are. <laughs> and this is uh, an interesting runner. She was a little bit behind at the first TV control. Um, then uh, was in the lead, actually, at the Arena Passage. And now she's running for a good time, even to the second TV control. Let's see how she compares then with Alice Lee. Uh, this won't be fast enough. Lead. But Alice took a, a second to hesitate there. We, we talked about it in the men's race. This yeah, but it was really only one second hesitating, so it's That's not true. a lot of time. No, no, but not one second can be, uh, can be a difference in uh, sprint orienteering. I think it's, it's strange to see if so few easy controls. Um, and yeah. you've, I think for me, it's testing different parts of the sprint orienteering for me. Therese Yanishikova, she's got a knee absolutely taped up here. She was one of those who, he, she actually fell during the knockout sprint. And I know she was hobbling around a little bit with her knee, so maybe not in uh, the, the, the form that she wants to be in. What mm -hmm. happens here? Here we see Gempele. Oh, hard to say with her GPS, I don't know what's... Maybe more the Olson. Oh. oh she changes no i think she just goes way. behind the the other way she goes the other way past the yeah very hard south, to say from this gps river, I, think. <laughs> I think she goes south of the river on the way to nine which is not quick olsen i think she will be disappointed with that one 51 seconds behind that is really not what she wanted to see at all Uh, not the best championship for her, Caroline Olsson. 
Meanwhile, we have Marika Taini at the Arena Passage into eighth position, 12 seconds behind. Emma Biesmo, who is in the lead still. Her strength really is the middle distance. And this is, is Tova Alexanderson. Okay. There almost, are. Yeah. Almost turning a little bit too early there. We have to really mention every second of hesitation oh. here for Tova. <laughs> We have to find some way to critique her performance. She doesn't give us many opportunities at all. And uh, this is live then with some of the runners here. Uh, let's see there. Yeah, I think Emma Biesmo was running into a dead end. So maybe losing time here. Or well, not maybe, she is definitely losing time here. So now she's not pre-warned yet. You can see it. Wasn't a good route from the beginning. Going, backing out from 15. And then running into this dead end. She will lose a lot of time. Here she is. Here's Sarah Hagstrom, though. Into oh, yeah, the it finish. is. Definitely. Sarah Hagstrom is also late. We will follow her through. And then the next runner we will see is Alice Lee. Uh, so Sarah Hagstrom outside the top six. Or maybe, well, maybe not outside the top six. She's caught up a couple of places at the end. But Alice Leak is also on the run in. Can Alice Leak take a new fastest time here? It's looking good, but what will the gap be? She's fighting hard here. And a big new leading time then for Alice Leak. Big at this stage, 17 seconds. You can see how she turned around the race between control 10 and 13. Definitely a few good route choices here. And the second part of the race. So now this is quite a big gap between Alice Leek and Elin Gempelin. And here we are with Elena Ruos on the way to the second TV control. You can see at control 10, equal time. And one runner who we haven't seen through at this point is Andrina Benjaminson, who has gone equal fastest with Alice Leek at that point. Looking good for Eleanor yeah, Ross. Let's see if she, yes, I think she will have a new best time here. 15 seconds left. Definitely a new best time for Elena Ruos. Didn't manage to reach the final in the knockout sprint. But here is Tova Alexanderson. We actually didn't get her split time cut. I think we may have lost information from the split time. We have oh, her split she time. She she's in 19. She was 19. Yeah, but now she's not way behind anymore. Now she's only two seconds. You can see it there on the screen. 16 seconds behind at the first TV split. Now she's only two. And uh, I mean, that's, that's what we were talking about before. She is really, I mean, she, she, she can make mistakes and still win this race. I think she has, um, yeah, she would need other mistakes uh, to let anyone else win this race, I but guess. But it can happen. We've seen that and from Emma Biesmo, who was in leading positions early on, and she will be very annoyed, I think, mm. with that. A little shake of the head from uh, Emma Biesmo. You could see that she didn't choose a good route choice out from control. Let's see, 15, and then running into this dead end. Ah, There's a lot of time she lost there. And then she wasn't even on the fastest route this part. So it's, it's like a triple time loss here. You can also mention that we have a fast time at the first TV control. Uh, not in the picture here, but first split Megan Carter Davis. The best time seven seconds ahead of Andrina Benjamin. Incredible start from Carter Davis, but we will follow Anna Dricon. She has become the uh, the first leg runner for the Norwegian sprint relay team. Uh, not that experience, but this is a good, I think, a good result for her. Into the top six, or just outside the top six then, for Dricon at this particular point. Let's have a look. We can yeah. compare Leek and Alexanderson. Alexanderson must, we think, have made a mistake around here because she is here. She was it. running into a dead end in the very yeah. beginning of this leg. There we have the time loss for sure, and then not on the best route there. Simona Abersol, the other one, losing a lot of time in the beginning, but then uh, was able to pick up, yeah, catch she some time. Put up a good route, I think, from five to six, the other long route choice leg. Into sixth place, equal with Eleanor Ross, who we know was fastest at the second TV split. Mm. It's 
soon we are waiting for the runner we haven't seen in the picture yet mm -hmm. but it's a good has a good split at the second TV control. Here she is Here on the way to is. the last control, Andrine Benjaminsen from Norway. Andrine Benjaminsen, oh, I think it will be close with the time of Alice Lee. She's got a good finish here. Uh, she was just two seconds behind at the previous control. This so will be what very tight. Will it be? It's going to be so tight. What can Benjaminsen do? Will she challenge that lead of Alice Lee? The finish line is coming very, very shortly. What will it be then? I think she will just be late one second behind Alice Lee. Oh, and the next runner we wait for is Elena Ross. Mm, and here we have the comparison. Maybe also the reason why Abersold lost a lot of time in the beginning. It, she did exactly the same. No, she didn't. But she did. A lot I think of a different one. Yeah. yeah, she went in a different uh, garden. We have seen that before. Who was it in the men's race? I can't remember who yeah, it was. Robertson. It feels like a long time. I think it was Tim Robertson. But Tim went further yeah, into yeah, the garden definitely. and lost more time. Okay. Yeah, with Elena Rose, and this might be a threat, Whoa, but she lost she time. She lost time, but she's got a fast finish. Just look, picking up five seconds between 17 and 18. She is such a quality this will, sprinter. This won't be enough to beat Alice Leek. So Elena Ross into the finish here. Will she will be outside the top two as well? Takes faster, Benjaminson. And Elena Ross, she is such a consistent performer, but third place currently. And soon to come here in the picture, Tuve Alexanderson on the way to the second TV split. And uh, look at this, she's still behind that control 10. Six seconds behind. She's not managed to uh, catch it up yet. Compared to Elena Ross, though. So remember, we have Alice Leek in the lead at the finish. So maybe we should be looking to compare that time of Tova Alexanderson. It will be tight Alice even Leek. compared to Alice Leek. Alice Leek is 10 seconds behind at this second TV control. Let's see here. We have the time still six. Yeah, I think uh, this will be faster, definitely. Up, she's picking up seconds here, there, and everywhere. And Alexanderson takes the lead. But also we can mention that the arena passage, Megan Carter Davis into a new best time. 14 seconds faster than Emma Biesmo. And we know that Emma Biesmo lost a lot of time, so she's 16 seconds faster than Tuve Alexanderson. And uh, Megan Carter Davis was the last starter as well, so but she is the last one there. Yana Shikova into fourth place working really really hard she is a uh, i feel like one day it will come well for her yeah we might see why or where elena rose lost time yeah it was on the route choice not a good route there it was kind of the she didn't do the triple bs mistake but she did at least one of it uh the route choice in itself itself isn't it very good i think this is the place where she lost the lead Uh, so the next runners we are waiting for, Simona Abersol to the second TV control and then the last starter, Megan Carter Davis. But Alice Leek in the lead. Here is uh, Simona Abersol. Looks like she's probably caught up Charlotte Ward here. She has indeed. Simona Abersol was the second last starter. Charlotte Ward the third last starter, I think. Mm, but you can see at control 10, she is behind. Nine seconds behind. And that's behind the time of Eleanor or um, a yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Eleanor Ross at that I think point. it is Eleanor Ross, yeah. So we'll see what Abersol can do then. Abersol at the Arena Passage was just behind to Alex Anderson, two seconds behind. She is still behind. She's even further behind now, I guess. It's, it's not close. much, it's, it's not, not much. much. She is 10 seconds quicker than Alice Leek, our current leader at the finish though. I think mm -hmm. that's when you so want to look for. now we are waiting for Megan Carter-Davis coming to this second TV control as well. See here, you can see some of the orienteering of Megan Carter-Davis. She had some hesitation into control five, but then had a good route here to get this lead. 
And here she is. She is then through to this TV split time. What can she do? Oh, it's really close at and the top we, here. We have really seen oh. that many times now. The fight between Megan Carter Davis and Tuve Alexanderson. I feel like they were in the same qualifier as well. I think the fates brought them together. Yeah, and uh, Megan Car Carter Davis beat, has beaten Tuve Alexanderson in the qualifier. Yeah, absolutely. And will she go and into a lead here? Yes, she will. I think she will. Oh, but it's tight. It's oh. only four seconds. Oh, incredibly tight. And there's still a bit of running to go. So Carter Davis, Alexanderson, Abersold, separated by six seconds then and ahead have... of Eleanor Ross who's already into the finish Alice Leek in first place currently remember and we have about four minutes of running to go we haven't seen that control yet but here is Alice Leek in the lead and in about a minute we are waiting for Tuve Alexanderson she's here in the picture let's see let's see how this race is developing for the big star of the sport, Tuve Alexanderson. She is the huge star of orienteering. And we'll see what she is able to do. Alice Leek waiting nervously at the finish line. And it's going to be... That was a... I not, don't think that was Oh, and look at that. 19 that. seconds oh. behind that Control 17. 12 seconds at 18. I don't think she's going to make it. She no, she most definitely not. Tova Alexanderson will not win here today. She is late. She's proven that she is human. She is yeah, human. Yeah. She's not hers today. And, so uh, Alexanderson... Oh, she is outside of and the And I can top tell three. you, Catherine, we will have a British win victory today. It's either Alice Leek or Megan Carter Davis who is going to be the world champion. Well, victory or no, because we've still got Abbasol to go through. Oh yeah, that's true. I'm not, I'm, I'm not there yet. So they've got a medal. So let's One see of them here. Has got a medal, Alice Leek, and yeah, you can see that Abbasol is ahead. I totally forget that, about the episode. <laughs> of course, we have to count the episode in because she is ahead of Leek. And she's running alongside uh, Charlotte Ward, the two of them running together. But Megan Carter Davis is the last starter. Alice, has Alice knows that I think she's got a medal because it won't be Charlotte Ward. Yep. She knows she's got a medal. But what a performance by the British team at this World Championship. But let's take Simone Abersold, of course. I totally forgot about Abersold, to the finish. And it's looking very good for Simone Abersold. It looks like she will overtake Alice Leek here. But Alice, she was fourth last time. She will get a medal this time. Mm -hmm. And here, second last control. So it's now only to cross this street. Punch the last control, and this definitely will be a new best time. A new best time for Simona Amersold. It's going to be fantastic. She's worked her way up throughout this after not being in that much in contention at the beginning. But Amersold, she will get a silver medal at worst here. And we wait for and Megan Carter Davis. What a race by Simona Amersold. What a I mean, she was at the first TV control. She was 15, 19 seconds behind, and now we are only waiting for Megan Carter Davis. So here she is, Megan Carter Davis. And it She's looks four good seconds for her. Lead here. She's really got to run super fast to be able to make it. This is going to be so, so tight here. Punching so the second the last control. control. Checking the flash here, checking the beep. It's looking incredible. Oh, this Megan is going to be good Davis. enough. The cheers here as Megan Carter Davis punches the last control. And will she be a world champion? Yes, she will. She's got two silvers on this competition already. The smile is on her face. Megan Carter Davis does it. She is the world champion. And that is absolutely incredible. Tears all around from the British.
British team, Charlotte Ward giving her a hug and my goodness me. I mean, what a championship for the British team. First, they take the medal in the sprint relay. Uh, then we have the medal of Megan Carter Davis in the knockout sprint. And then now they have two medals. And think of it. Hang if, on, I'm waiting till we get the download yeah, here. Because I'm sorry, but at least one medal it will be. And I'm very sure that there will be two medals. Goodness but you me. could really, I mean, she was so good during the last competition. She was so, so good in the knockout sprint. Of course, uh, we needed a not perfect run by Tove Alexanderson to make this happen. But she was there. She was there in Burros, was very close. She was there in the knockout sprint, was very close. And now she... She, it felt. It feels as if she was on the waiting list until something happens yeah. at one point with Tove, and uh, very well deserved. Very well deserved. Yeah. Also for Alice League. What a, I mean, what a history for for her as well. And uh, she's been gradually improving. And but we also have to me. name Simona Abersold. She has struggled a lot with injuries and. She didn't have a good start into this race. Uh, I mean, uh, I almost yeah, look, forgot about her. There, she had a know? big yeah. mistake. Um, and in the end, I mean, it really needed mistakes from the two big favorites or for the two big names from the last years uh, to make this happen. But I mean, you have to be ready when you get the chance and Megan Carter Davis most definitely was ready when she got the chance today. Yeah, you have to and I not think make here, a mistake. I think there was, was a small a mistake at there. control five, but then she had a good route out from control five to six. Um, also here you can see that all of the medalists were running through this backyard. But the, the, the gap here is huge already. Good route here by Alice Leek. Mm -hmm. I guess this is Cutting the fastest one. Yeah. For me, it's a little bit slower from Abbasold there. Mm -hmm. Then uh, this quite physical part, I mean, all the way from Control 5, the second part of the route to Control 6. Uh, uh, not the quickest route, I think, there from Carter Davis to 8. No, but not the slowest one either. And then here you can see that Abersol is getting quite close. So maybe you have to see if there is another route where they split up. Good route here by all three of them. This is the shortest route. And you can just 11. run straight through yeah. from the, the little passageways back into the courtyards behind. Very strong. Same routes here as well, of course, to control 12. There's no not much of a route choice to 13 either. Interesting will be control 15 to 16 because there are different mm -hmm. options on this route. See that both of them are going this middle way, which is quite good. Um, it's not the shortest one, but it's a good one. All three of them actually chose to do this. And you can see it's really, apart from this mistake by Abersold in the very beginning, they they did a really good job with choosing the route choices here. There's not much to not complain about. Not much to about. complain about at all, no. I think when you look back at the analysis and you look at the difference, then it's incredible. So I think we will hear from the winner now from Megan Carter-Davis. Megan, you're the world champion. Explain your feelings right now. Um, I'm really amazed. I'm quite surprised. <laughs> um, I don't think it'll sink in for a while. Um, but yeah, that, <laughs> I wasn't expecting it off that race because I did stop a lot to check my routes and I didn't think I would be going as fast as Tova. Um, but I really just tried to take it as cleanly as possible. And I think I did that. Um, I don't think I lo lost any time really. Um, it was just, it didn't feel like my highest speed because I stopped so much, yeah. You were a good runner before, but now you're the best. What, uh, what have you improved to this season? Um, I think my self-confidence is the main thing, um, like believing that I can uh, compete at the highest level and just aiming to race like normal, like I do in Britain. Um, yeah, we've got a really good standard of girls in Britain and guys as well, like the team standard is crazy at the moment. 
and I think we all just keep raising the bar for each other <laughs> and yeah that's kept me focused <laughs> in the last few years. What do you think this will mean to you? Um, I think it'll, well yeah we've got Edinburgh in 2024 so I'm going to try and defend it obviously um, but for now I'm just going to enjoy it. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Mm. Two very interesting things. She mentioned that she stopped a lot. Which she was, kind of saw on the track yeah, a little bit. That she was, the focus was on picking the right route choices, and you can see that. I mean, there were as much as I can see, there was no really bad route choice there. And the second one is the self-confidence. I mean, you can yeah, you can feel that when she's starting. Of course, she, you can see that she knows about that. Maybe not, that she's maybe not going to win if she has a good race. But only the fact that she dares to stop before she is taking decisions shows that she has great self-confidence because that's exactly what you do when you're not sure and you have the confidence that you could end up high, end high up in the result list. Then you dare to stop and dare to make good decisions. She's such a humble person who has a great team around her. She is so generous to everybody around her. But if I look back to a couple of years ago or before the pandemic where she didn't necessarily think she'd make, you know, she didn't really feel like she belonged in a in a final of the knockout sprint. She went out in the semi-final. It just didn't feel like she believed that difference has made it so much. Alice Leek, she's improved. She got a top 10 uh, at the World Champs in uh, in Latvia. She got fourth place in the Czech Republic. She's now improved that to third place. And she's realized this, that what she just has to have is kind of a normal run. You don't have to do anything special, but you have to be, just not make any mistakes. And you, she just, and that's a normal run for her. And you end up with a bronze medal. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy. I promised you a gold medal and you got one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the try I'm doing trying to be unbiased this whole way, but um, you know, I know I've known the team now for a good few years and it's amazing to see them have that success. I mean it's really amazing to see that team and that's also something she mentioned here that they have so such a high quality in the trainings and in their team now. I mean you can see it here. Yep. Two runners in top three, uh, Chris Jones who missed out from from the medals very yeah and Ralph Street unlucky in the top and Ralph Sticks. Ralph Street in top six. Uh, the, the sprint relay team is really amazing. So it's yeah, I mean yeah, it looks good for Edinburgh. Yeah, bring on Edinburgh 2024. That's what I say. Um, there will a lot of expectation, of course, going to be on the British team at that point. But and maybe the most emotional runner today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she didn't have a very good World Cup. At, um, in, in Sweden, in Boros, she set a new 5K PB coming into this. So she kind of knew her form was there, but maybe not the, the confidence in her orienteering. Uh, and for me, that is incredible stuff from Alice. Also very impressive. We, went, we mentioned that before. Uh, Simona Abersold uh, struggled a lot with injuries. Oh, had uh, not, I mean, she was not in very good shape in Burwas you could see that I mean mm. the, the shape was it was she was performing okay, okay really but uh, not where she wanted it to be yes though. exactly uh, she's her quest for a, a world title continues though a gold medal continues but the new world champion to uh, end the run of Tova Alexanderson's wins at the World Cup I am delighted to say it is Megan Carter Davis and I can't quite believe it, to be honest. And uh, Gustav Bergman in the men's race saved the streak of Sweden. They are the only nation still who have won a medal at every sprint race at the World Championships. And uh, I mean, it was close. We we would not have expected that uh, Gustav would be the one no. saving this of all of streak. the of all of the Swedes. Yeah, not yeah, I mean, well, of yeah, course he would have had the chance, but we would have. You would have expected it to be Tova exactly. Alexanderson. So congrats to those top three. What shall we end with? Some thoughts about this World Championships as a whole. What have you made of it? We look at the the medal table there. Sweden, of course, at the top. Uh, Great Britain in second place, but. A really, I, for me, it felt like a really technical set of races, and, and you had to do a fantastic orienteering to be able to win any of those medals. Yeah, it was very high-class uh, competitions, 
not only from the athletes, but also from the organizers, the course setters. Um, for me, I mean, the, the highlights of this week, Ivan Donghen uh, winning the medal for Netherlands, Yannick Michels winning a medal for Belgium, and then the performance by the British team, just great throughout the whole week. Uh, Kasper Fosser returning in an impressive way. Also the style, Kiburts won his title was very... It, 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 we had very interesting races throughout uh, the whole week and uh, that's cool. A very incredible World Championships all round. Thank you so much to everyone who made it happen. Congratulations to our medal winners from throughout the week and today. And I think the next time we will see you will be for the European Championships in Estonia. So we will see you then. See you then. This great, great event. What a sport. I didn't know I liked orange sailing. It's a great sport. It's exciting. Even though the Swedes win too much all the time. <laughs> we have had more than 350 elite athletes in the, competing over the last three days and more than 800 amateur athletes. Let's give them a, an applause, all of them.